And I came back to him about a week or two later and I said, what area of the apartment hasn't been touched or changed in the 20 plus years you've been in the industry? It took him a couple of weeks and he came back and he said, there's one area that I can think of that hasn't been really touched and I don't see any money in it. And that's the closet area. It's usually a rod and a shelf, wire racking. It's something very basic. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. Hello and welcome to episode 281. My guest today has developed a program that is designed to increase rents by 3 to 5% without costing you a huge capital improvement. He accomplishes this by optimizing your rental space. Jim Monk is the president of Closets, that's C-L-O-Z-Z-I-T-S, and he believes space optimization is a game changer for existing properties as well as new construction. Creating more space for residents is a bigger issue than most owners think, and Jim is here to tell us why. Jim, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Brian. Before we get into closets and space optimization, which I think is going to be a fascinating conversation, tell us a little bit about yourself. Do you have a real estate investing background? You know, What was it that led you to space optimization for rental properties? As I like to say, it's a a windy road. Passive investor, uh, invested in several thousand units. Uh, Previous to that, uh, executive uh, of a number of financial services companies and some technology companies and had done quite well with exits on those companies, Um, scaled them up to quite large sizes. Uh, And um, then, you know, as you diversify your portfolio, you know, you're you're looking at what you can go into. And so multifamily was where I decided to put some of my uh, cash and and, and, uh, winnings, as I like to call it. And, uh, you know, as time went on, uh, we, you know, as I had friends and met other people, you learn a little bit more about it and, you know, it, it becomes something that's, um, it becomes a little bit of a passion to you. And so we had actually, um, myself and a couple of partners had come together and like most people in the value add space of apartments, we've done our, we did our flooring. We did our renovations. We did the hard surfaces and paint, roofing, all those different things. And we'd gotten kind of to the end of the road of what we could do. And it led us into uh, a conversation that turned its way to closets. Tell us about that conversation. How did that go? Did you say, hey, we need more space for our, our tenants? I wish I could say it was about telling our tenants that we wanted more space. We were actually looking at it from a business point of view and saying, what can we do to move the needle so that we can get rent increases? <laughs> I mean, that ultimately, that's what we were trying to do. And what we were looking at as well at the time was uh, here in Dallas and some of the other areas where we were investing, that new uh, inventory was coming online. So you, you had a lot of new construction happening and, you know, you're in a B property set or an A property set, which is where we played in those two categories. And the new uh, builds that were coming out were just so amenity driven. And you're looking at, well, how can I compete with that? You know, just two miles down the road, I've got a new mid-rise in play here that's loaded out with amenities. And we can't compete with that resort type pool that they've just spent a ton of money on or different things. So what led to it was uh, my business partner who's in closets, uh, a gentleman by the name of Stephen Bolos, was ran the largest renovations company in multifamily in the country, which is now called Katera. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Katera. It's a very large uh, vertically integrated construction company. And I simply asked a question, which is, you know, as you go working with these REITs and these large scale portfolios of, of, um, of apartment complexes and student housing, what are you seeing these guys do? And, uh, you know, frankly, he told me, he said, they're doing about what you're doing. 
you know, not, not a lot's changed in the last 15 to 20 years. You know, it's your quartz, your granite, you know, you may can upsize some of the quality of the amenity set to differentiate, but you, you're pretty much on target. And so it took me a little bit and, and I tend to like to noodle things over in the conversations. And I came back to him about a week or two later and I said, Stephen, what area of the apartment hasn't been touched or changed in the 20 plus years you've been in the industry? He goes, well, that's a great question. I hadn't thought about it really. And so it took him a couple of weeks and he came back and he said, there's one area that I can think of that hasn't been really touched and I don't see any money in it. And that's the closet area. It's usually a rod and a shelf, wire racking. It's something very basic. And I said, why is that? And he goes, it's utilitarian. And I, I told him at that point, I said, well, that's, that's really interesting because I know that the home I live in and, and the home you live in and the homes that a lot of us live in have been upgraded. And I'm assuming the residents of multifamily would like something similar if they could have it. You know, you have so many shows now around organization, around closet systems. You have people taking pictures, celebrities taking pictures of their closets, and people see that. And you have your millennials and your boomers, who are your biggest renting class. You know, people like my mom, who have a lifetime supply of stuff that they're taking around. So storage is critically important. And for the millennials and those that are renting at that level, they're looking for resort type amenities. And we'd learn that through seeing our competition out there with the newer construction. And so the question I had was, can you make a business case out of the closet space to generate revenues, additional revenues, and are people willing to pay for those? And what was the answer to that? Could, can you make a business case for it? And what is that business case? Absolutely. So we started with our B cost property set about three years ago, beta testing. So we started on our own units and we were seeing, and this is obviously pre-COVID, uh, we were seeing between a two to 4% rent increase. And so we looked at that and said, okay, and what kind of ROI can we really see out of this? And so we were finding at the time, again, mind you, this is a beta test. So we don't have efficiencies of manufacturing and scale and some other things there. But, and I have a manufacturing background as well. So, you know, I'm looking at this going, okay, how do we gain those efficiencies to drive costs down? And what we found was our ROI was running about 28 to 30% after two and a half years. That's what we were tracking. And that's ROI, your return on investment on the money that you spent to increase the, the closet size or address Correct. the closet space. Correct. And where that really hit home was when you extrapolate out what that means in a rent increase between uh, 20 to $25 per month per unit set, and you look at where that's doing to your, you know, your NOI. And then from us, we were looking at a couple exits. And so we started looking at what is this doing to our bottom line on the asset? And we were astonished to find that we're looking at things in, you know, in the millions potentially on an investment of say, you know, for our original one, it was around $250,000 investment. That's full turnkey on 300 and some odd, uh, 330 units. We were looking at, uh, you know, getting back in return on that with a cap rate at the time of about, oh, I think we were at a, we were at about, five, oh, 5.2 or something at the time. It was, a, it was a pretty good cap rate. So we extrapolated that out and came out with, we're getting about two point something million dollars here. So almost 10 times the amount of money you're spending, you're getting back in value that you're adding to the building. Correct. And so my immediate thought was, you know, we could go out to the marketplace, but we decided to be pretty surgical about how we went to the marketplace. And so we didn't go to syndicators or your, your local investment groups and so forth. We decided to go after your large scale REITs, or your large scale portfolio clients. And the reason why was to gain efficiencies and drive the cost down. We need volume, massive amounts of volume. And so, and we needed infrastructure. You know, the, our proc weighs a lot. And so for us to work with clients in say Phoenix or Houston or uh, Michigan, you know, or Chicago, you know, the, wherever we're looking to go, we needed those big companies to be able to pull us in there with a really large portfolio set so that we could at least get 
what we call a lighthouse account, you know, to get started and to put a warehouse in there and get our installers in there. So for us, the way we've done that is we manufacture the product, we design the product, we manufacture the product ourselves. We even install the product ourselves, or we sell the product directly to our clients. And so we have vertical integration. So we were cutting out all the middle people. But to your question, we went to the large groups like, and I don't know if your listeners know who these people are, but uh, fascinating to look at, like MAA, the Harbor Group. Um, all these companies have tens of thousands of doors, if not hundreds of thousands of doors. Um uh, you know, Bascom, Nightvest, you know, big, big REITs. And we started doing these tests where they were actually running numbers and figuring out, okay, does this work? And what they found was it absolutely works. And so what you'll see out there today in the marketplace is in less than a year now, and this is obviously taking into account COVID, you know, we did, we started um, you know, roughly three years ago. We beta tested for quite a while. We got our manufacturing developed out our product that we needed, started building a team around that. That was about a year. And then the last year we've been selling and now we're in 17 markets, Brian. So we're, we're growing pretty rapidly. Thanks for ex- explaining the, the business side of it. What What is the actual product? I mean, what take us through a unit, how you go in and you assess the space optimization and what closets actually does with that space. So what we're typically doing is we're looking at What we found is, depending on the construction type and different areas and how materials are being used, we had to have a product that was somewhat a system that could easily conform to those, you know, those footprints and the different dynamics that play into it. So that was one of the things that we had to kind of overcome over about a year period. And we also wanted something that was a, as best could be a no cut product in the field so that installers didn't have to, you know, sometimes there's no power in these units, you know, things are shut off. Um, and, and this brings up a, a valid point. Let me take a step back. We um, we go after renovations or remodels and, or, or uh, turns. Uh, we're not going after just new construction. New construction is only about 5% of our business. This is for the existing unit sets because that to us is the largest piece of inventory out there in the marketplace. And for a lot of ourselves in the in the investment world of multifamily or ownership of multifamily, again, you may be in your second or third renovation and there's not much to do. So this product was designed for those make ready or turns. And so when we're talking about our client base, that's how we approach them. And so we're typically walking into a unit set that already exists. It has either wire and MDF based product. And the first thing we're doing is we're taking base level measurements. Okay, wait, wait. Let me stop you there because I, you, you're using a couple of terms that sound fancy, but it sounds like you're going in, you're looking at the closet, and yes. seeing how much space you have to work with. Is that what you meant? That is, that's exactly right. We're throwing down a tape measure and we're measuring the dimensions of the the closet. Yes. Okay. And are you working with the the existing dimensions or are you also figuring out how to expand on that, how to create more space? Most of our clients uh, want us to work within the confines of what's existing, but because of the way our system operates, we can gain efficiencies um, on the uh, area uh, by going from a single, let's say rod to a double rod system, which is something that you see back behind me. Um, So there are ways to gain uh, you know, footage there um, in the space and, and double that in many cases without having to change the footprint of the existing closet. It really has to do with the contraptions that you're putting in the closet to maximize right. the, the use of that space in, in the, the existing closet. Correct. And it sounds like you are you want to be operating with the economy of scale. So you're looking for apartment complexes, that have a certain number of units so that it's worth it for you to go in and kind of do a, uh, you know, one uniform design that's going to work in all the closets in that, that property. Correct. But I will tell you this, when we started talking about the economies of scale, we are receiving that from our, our larger client base. And so now we have, uh, you know, just entered into working with syndicators and smaller group sets where, an example, we're in Phoenix. We have, we have prospective people find out about us and they'll say, look, I have, a duplex, or I have 
60 unit complex. Can you install? And we say, absolutely, because we already have material there. We have installers. It's just a matter of getting them into the rotation and set up. And so to kind of go back to your question, how we engage the client is we get the, the footprint and measurements of that. Our design team internally works off of basically a number of SKUs that we have or a number of cabinets. We have different cabinets and different sizes of cabinets. And it's like a jigsaw puzzle. We're putting it together to optimize that space. And that ultimately gives us our pricing and our pricing is very static. Um, whether or not you're a large scale company or the duplex, you're gaining those efficiencies. And so the nice thing is we wanted the little guy like ourselves, even that were investors to be able to compete and have the same price point as the big guys. And so we've We've standardized everything to that level. What are some of the tricks then that rental property owner or landlord can use on their closet space to maximize that space and, and make it attractive for potential tenants? Whether or not it's us, you know, that, that you're working with on this, I think some of the real clever ways that you see things happening today is they'll they'll simply go in and add a um, an additional, let's call it row of either wire or MDF with a, a like a rod and a shelf uh, with either a local trim carpenter or, um, you know, their maintenance team. So there are, that's the very first thing that I would say. I think some of the challenges is getting uniformity. That's one of the biggest things we hear. Uh, it's, it's challenging for some of these groups to get that uniformity. What, what does that mean, uniformity? To make it look like the other existing stuff in the, in the, uh, the closet. So, you know, the challenge for a lot of these folks out there is they may be working something that's 20 years old. You know, it, it already has a rotten shelf. It's been there for years. And so they may not be able to source the materials that, to match up or, you know, some of them are, they're looking at the aesthetic appeal. Um, you know, so, and then the other challenge is the way we approach it is not about just the way it looks. It's really about, can it drive additional revenues to you? And one of the things we've went against time and time again is, the wire racking and the rod and the shelf, the basic rod and shelf are not enough to justify a two to 5% rent increase. It's utilitarian with what you see behind me. It's a furniture grade product. So there's aesthetics to it that allow the renter or the resident to be willing to pay a little bit more of a premium for that product. And when you say furniture grade product, you mean it's a nicer quality than just like the wire racks you would pick up at Target. That is correct. And so for us, our product is a three quarter inch birch wood. It's a melamine finish on there. So it's scratch resistant. It's designed to, and this is our fifth iteration in just two years. So we have a lot of field information coming back. It's designed to withstand a lot of um, wear and tear in, uh, abuse, unfortunately, sometimes that residents can put on these units. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about green property management. Not only do they manage everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then green property management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property property manager interested in applying green property management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. If you're thinking of leaving your W-2 job and becoming a full-time real estate investor, one of the greatest costs you must consider is health care for you and your family. When I made this transition myself, I found the whole health care insurance process to be confusing and frustrating. That's why I'm glad I met Chad Creasy at RCB & Associates. Chad is a professional health insurance agent who helps real estate investors and small business owners understand and choose their best health care options. And best of all, his services are covered by the insurance company and won't cost you a dime. If you live in Michigan and are expecting a change in your health care insurance coverage for any reason or losing employer coverage or transitioning into Medicare, then you owe it to yourself to contact Chad Creasy at rcbassociatesllc.com. When a, a potential resident is looking at a unit and they see the closet built out, what makes them say, oh, I'm willing to pay $25 more a month 
to have this in my unit? That's a great question. One is, and you, you hit on that at the beginning, it's space optimization. The very first thing that they're looking at is, I've got more footage here that I can work with to store the stuff I, I have. The second thing that they're looking at is the, the aesthetics of it and how it makes them feel in that space. You know, a lot of attention is spent on the, the open areas. You know, it's spent on the flooring, it's spent on the kitchen, it's, it's spent in those areas. And when you look at and you see studies out there, and we have some of that information on our own website, the general population typically will look at the different spaces. And the, the, one of the big ones for them is storage. So basic storage. And then when you tie in the uh, beauty of the product and, you know, candidly, 62 to 63% of the individuals walking through a complex or into a unit to, to rent are female that plays a very large part. That's actually one of our bigger target audiences is the female renter. And they're the ones who typically will say, okay, I like this. I can see this. I can see my shoes over here, my clothing over here, things very well organized. Uh, So it's really designed to elicit a better experience in the, in that actual square footage, especially with a shelter in place and what's happened with COVID more often than not, you're you're in that space a lot more. What is it at a minimum that a potential tenant needs to see as far as storage and storage space? And at what point do they say, wow, this is great. I've got a lot of storage and I'm willing to pay more for it. So I think when you're looking at the client and the resident and our feedback has been, a lot of them expect to walk into um, a location with a single rod system. So just a rod and a shelf that that's what they've seen. That's what they expect. And so what happens in that situation, and maybe halfway up the wall, but they're not utilizing all of that, that cubic footage as they could. And so what they're looking at is, okay, how much floor space do I have? And, and ideally, and as we stage and we show, like I said, pictures behind me, you can optimize that to get 50% more plus the top shelf space you know, our product being it's plywood, it's designed to not warp, you know, it's, it's a cleated based system, meaning it's got, you know, cleats on the back, wooden strips that cause it to not bend and bow so that you can put a lot of weight on it. And so for a lot of them, the expectation is simply, I'm going to come into the same system. A lot of them, the feedback we've received has been on, I really get worried on my wire racking, how much weight it can hold. You know, frankly, we don't think about those types of things. But a lot of times they've had, uh, wall, you know, these units pull away from the wall, the wire racking pulls away because it either wasn't fastened in properly or it's just. When you're talking about wire racking, are you talking about like wire shelves that might be in the closet or, or what exactly yes, is wire the, racking? These are like vented. If you've ever seen them, I'm, I'm sure you probably have. It's like vented uh, wire racking. It's real thin. You can find it at Home Depot or other places like that that are like garage organizers. That's what's in a lot of unit sets. Um, If I look at what resides in most of these, that's what we see. And it's because it's inexpensive. It's easy to put in. It's uniform. It's very utilitarian, um, but it, it, it it does the job. But the case that we tried to make and the reason why our clients use us is because it supports that rent increase ultimately, that ultimately that two to 5% rent increase and a strong ROI. That's why our clients today use it. I, I wish I could say it was because you know utilization of space and how it looks for the resident, but it's the business case that they're really shooting for. I'm trying to get to the heart of what is it exactly that increases rent? Is it because they're seeing uh, the furniture grade shelving and you know more than just one rack going across? I mean, what, what are they seeing that makes them say, okay, I want to pay $25 more? For the resident, it is really about the experience and the differentiation when they walk in there. Our product deliberately is white, so it brightens up the space more and they can visualize what they're putting in there. It, it, it opens it up more typically. It's not a dark, dingy place, which is typically what happens in a lot of these places. So it it's like coming in and doing a renovation in the kitchen. Uh, it's something you, new and unique. So for a lot of these residents, the feedback we receive when they do walks is that's unique and that's an impressionable item because typically their expectation is when they walk into the closet, 
what's the square footage and is it wire or is it some sort of base MDF that's been painted multiple times in a one light bulb? And so for them, when they walk in, it's, it's the words we've heard, it's like a cherry on top of a Sunday, or it's a real big surprise. And emotionally, I felt good walking out of that unit because it, it was just an added bonus that we didn't expect. And so that's been very interesting. So what that told us, what that tells us today still is a lot of the ownership of apartments and the residents have been conditioned to think about the closet space as a utilitarian space. And what we're doing is opening up to be a functioning, a functioning piece uh, of the, and it is functioning, but a better um, experience overall. You know, the way I like to say it is uh, when I walk into my closet set every day and we all have this ritual and this was the, the softer side of it for, for myself. And one of the reasons why I'm passionate about closets is because I walk in there and it's my sanctuary. Every day I go in there and I pick out my clothing and it, it really defines who I am. I go in there and at the end of the day and I put on, you know, my shorts or whatever, whatever I'm doing or my running clothes. And so it, it really is a sanctuary for a lot of people. And if it is the traditional wire racking or MDF, I think a lot of these people say, you know what, I feel very comfortable in here and it makes me feel good. And I'm willing to pay more for that experience, that feeling. So what is the goal then with the capacity of the closet? Are, I know you're taking the same space and adding in your, your system. Are you doubling the, the capacity? Uh, are you, you know, increasing it by 50%? What is the actual goal as far as capacity? Average is between 40 and 52% increase in the actual utilization of the space that, that's not being uh, used today. So for a lot of our clients, it does double the size. You know, I'd say our average is about 47% increase in space utilization. So it's quite large. What are you taking into consideration in, in increasing that capacity? Uh, you know, if someone's storing something in their closet, is it typically clothes, shoes, coats? I mean, how do you account for those different items? There's a number of factors that we've considered. So with your older unit set, they're typically a little bit larger. You know, if you're talking B class and so forth, they're typically a, a little bit larger unit set than what is built out today. The stuff that is built out today is a much smaller footprint. Uh, and so uh, what we're looking at is in those different scenarios, you know, most of the time I would say 80% of the usage is around clothing. Uh, so th that's what we see. Then there's the other aspect of it of all the other ancillary items. So that can be anything from, you know, golf clubs, Christmas trees, all these other things that we've accumulated. And then it becomes, how can you properly store that in an effective manner? And so what we did was, that's one of the reasons why you see the top shelf there and that ability to use the space on the top uh, as well as on the bottom. Ours is a floating system. So you can put stuff underneath as well. Uh, so we've seen all kinds of stuff that's stored on these, everything from, like I said, golf clubs to um, winter clothing and stuff up on the top levels. And so that's kind of a longer term storage play. And that's usually, like I said, makes up between 15 to 20% of the utilization. Take us through some sizes. What, what's a typical size of a closet? What size is good for a, a tenant? Our average client uh, out there, when we look at all the unit sets that we install, is about a four by eight on average. I wish I could say it was rectangular, but we do get all kinds of interesting footprints. But the average utilization is about four by eight, four by 10. So is that eight, eight foot wide, four foot deep? So yeah, it can be either a reach in. So those are the types that we see quite often, reach ins. But if you're talking about the primary closet, that might be a... Yeah, four foot to you know five foot wide, uh, eight foot deep type unit set. So usually deep. Um, and again, it depends. I will tell you that what's been very interesting, Brian, is in the older unit sets, the layouts, I would call it the layouts or designs, there may be only five to 10 layouts. 
you know, within the apartments. With the newest of units, you may be looking at a, a 200 unit complex that may have as many as 60 to 70 different configurations. So it's gotten more complex in that respect to make each experience a little different or uh, just how the architects decide, decide to design it with the ownership, which creates a lot more complexity for us. Um, it also, they have different classes within the units. You may have one that's a, a a four by eight, you may have one that's an upgrade that's a six by 12. So you have different sizes of closet systems in the newest of, within the last 10 years, the newest of systems or newest of apartment complexes. And where are these closets typically located? I mean, I imagine there's usually one by the front door so you can hang your coat and put your boots there. And then there's Correct. gotta be one in the, the bedroom. What else do you like to see? For us, actually where we see the supported rent increase, we've done a number of studies on this. The supported rent increase comes from the primary closet set. And so what we do is we have clients that will do those, obviously do the, the mud room or the entryway one uh, with this. And that's relatively simplistic. Um, it's a very simplistic one, uh, but the primary supported rents come from the, the primary closet. And then we do other things. What, like, what is a primary closet? Yeah, bedroom, Be either a master or a primary, it's called different terms. Um, within the uh, the unit. So let's talk about lighting. Mm -hmm. What kind of lighting do you hate to see in closets and what kind of lighting do you prefer to see? That's a great question. A simple incandescent, I, do we shake our head at? Because it's just dark and dingy. I always like to make the joke that a lot of times we walk into some of these closets and if you've ever seen the movie Saw or a dark, creepy movie, it, it comes out like that sometimes. You're like, wow, can you even see your own clothing? Or, you know, they can be pretty... Pretty bad. Um, that's, you know, that just can happen. So for a lot of them, and, and the nice thing is a lot of our clients are now moving to energy efficient bulbs that give better light output and better quality lighting. So those, you know, energy saving uh, fluorescence or, you know, uh, LEDs that we're seeing really light up the space. And so I would say that that's one of the things that we see that is a simple fix. Do you like to see a globe around it or some sort of fixture? I mean, what if, if I were at Home Depot, what would you tell me to buy? For us, diffusing the lights, probably one of the biggest things we've heard most people talk about. So I would say a fixture, if it's a long deep set, I mean, as simple as one of those, uh, it may not look attractive, but it's, it's, it's a utilitarian, it will work, is your long incandescent, you know, um, four foot section light strips is one way and you can get them in LEDs now. And so it gets better output of light, no heat or uh, so the, lo the long tube style light. Yep. The long tube style, but now they have them in LED format, you know, like the example behind behind me in the screen here, that was a long strip that they installed that was LED. So it had better power output, uh, but didn't consume nearly as much. And it, it just lit up the space. So to me, I would say, even my personal home, LED is the, the way to go. Um, it's long lasting and you can get a better quality light at your amount of it. I wanna go through the costs here. If you go into a, a space and let's start small because most of our, our listeners probably do not have 300 unit apartment complexes. Let's say they have right. a duplex and you go into that duplex and you look at the, the space. What, what does it typically cost to, to add your system? And, and what kind of rent increase could, could someone anticipate? So I'd like to speak on averages because we've done work coast to coast now on a daily basis in north to south. So what I would tell you is our national average, and this is us installing it. Now, mind you, we do sell the material and the designs because we have a lot of clients now that are turning to doing self-fulfillment uh, or um, you know, self-servicing themselves. So they are going in and they'll use their maintenance crews or, or local carpenter to do the installation after you've done the design work, mainly because they're able to get a better labor cost rate. For us, again, as a manufacturer, if I could just sell the material all day long, I, I would love that uh, for a lot of reasons. Because uh, scheduling and, you know, there's just a lot of logistics involved. Um, but we do have a lot of clients that are doing their own self-performance now. And so we'll ship the product to them. But our typical installed turnkey solution, you know, usually four by eight is roughly $750 is the investment into the closet, uh, the primary closet, I would say, uh, in the master or, you know, primary bedroom. So that's the average that we see across the country. 
the average increase today, and this is post COVID or, or post when it, it launched, I should say, uh, COVID uh, came out. You launched the product during the pandemic. So, uh, yes. So your numbers are based on pandemic numbers. They are based on pandemic numbers. Mm-hmm. We were holding our breath on because you just never know with how this is all going to play out. But our average client today sees a $35 rent increase on a class B property set and an average $42 on a class A. And that's that's an average across all markets that we're in. And they can uh, attribute that specifically to the, the closet space? Absolutely. And the way they do that, and, and there's a couple other things to consider. Usually our clients, and I, I chuckle a little bit about this, they never give you the the floor plans that are leasing up really well. They'll throw you in one of the ones that's been on the market for a while. And so most of our clients, I'm going to say 90% of them would say, oh yeah, you can go over here and you can beta test over here with this one. How long has it been on market? Three months. Mm, okay. So get get ready. <laughs> but they find that the average, our average lease up, when we went into these situations, you know, where they're giving us these difficult criterias is that they would not only get a lease up within two weeks, they'd get the rent increase. And so what we typically do is we'll beta test with our clients or they will test themselves or it might be two units, 10 units, 15 units. And they'll see, and they'll go, look, here's our, our base rate in the marketplace today. Can we get that? And so they'll ask for that and say, they won't even give it as an option. They'll say, look, this is an upgraded unit. Uh, it's now instead of a thousand dollars, it's a thousand thirty-five dollars because it's got an upgraded. You know, the the unit's been upgraded, and people will walk that and they will get that. And so, for a lot of our clients, the reason why they move forward with us, besides just the business case, is they're able to get lease ups faster. Then they can definitively say that rent up that that uh, thirty-five dollar increase came because of this. The average cost to install is seven hundred and fifty dollars, and that includes labor and material. Correct. Now there's maybe shipping and taxes depending on the state and everything. The average rent increase is thirty-five dollars a month. So you're mm-hmm. talking four hundred dollars increase in income a year from that, give or take. Correct. I'm not very good at math on the spot, but right around four hundred dollars in increased income for the year. It's a two year payback, basically. Correct. Our goal was a two to three and a half year payback. We do have some clients in the C property space um, that want it as a differentiator. And so they'll see a nine to $15 rent increase. So their ROI is further out, but they're really trying to either retain clients or they are just trying to differentiate in the marketplace. So some of the motivators for the listeners or the uh, or ownership vary. And, and that probably uh, is something to maybe talk about with your listeners on what some of these larger companies are doing because it's not just about the rent increase or even the lease ups, uh, as we talked about, you know, before coming on, some of them are doing it to defer profitability. Some of them are doing it for depreciation on the property set. Um, some of them are using it for tax advantages. Uh, so they've been very clever about doing that. Some of them are doing it for uh, acquisitions uh, and value engineering it in immediately. And we can talk about each of these things. And some of them are doing it as they get ready to exit because they want to show a program that's gonna increase the rent levels for the new ownership coming in. So it makes their property look more attractive for acquisition and potentially allows the current ownership to gain more money out of the transaction. Well, yeah, so you just touched on some very sophisticated reasons why people would invest in this type of capital improvement. Let's let's take a couple of them. Um, the first one I think was they want to defer income. Basic, basically, cool. they might maybe they have a lie tech property or something where they don't really need to show income or don't want to show income. Correct. Or they're wanting to hold off on taking the profits out. Uh, maybe the ownership is saying, you know, we just don't want to pay taxes on those profits this year. We want to wait. Maybe we want to look at what's happening in legislation or our local um, you know, state uh, taxes. And so what some of them are doing is they're coming in, they're saying, great, let's go ahead and put the closet system in and we can not only show it as an expense, we can depreciate it out, uh, you know, over, again, people need to talk to their tax advisors and so forth, but they can depreciate it out over a period of time. And so that allows us to keep 
our profitability kind of locked up in the in the complex and defer to another year and say, okay, do we want to take those out now based on new tax rulings? Well, that, that's a great reason if you have a property that's kind of at the end of its depreciation cycle and you're, you're Correct. looking for uh, new ways to, to find uh, uh, tax write-offs. Is, is this considered a, a capital improvement then that would be um, depreciable over a certain period of time? And is it fully depreciable under bonus depreciation? So I'm not the expert here, but my understanding behind talking to our clients is they're doing it over a certain period of time. And then some of them are writing off in the first year is my understanding. So I would assume that's probably into that bonusable type, uh, you know, uh, criteria. But that's where I was saying they definitely talk to a tax advisor on this. But it is it is classified as a capital expenditure. Um, you know, if, if it's coming out of CapEx, sometimes it's... Um, coming out of their operating budgets. So where they're doing it on those make ready and turns. And, and so that's one of the things that we've been very uh, understanding of is how it's being utilized because a lot of times they're coming in with CapEx and it's very, very defined. And so we're just, we're coming out here saying, look, here's our new program. And so for a lot of these guys, they have to really take a hard look and go, okay, do we want to spend it on the uh, dog park potentially which may get us a rent increase. Do we want to spend it on landscaping? What, what do we want to spend it on? And so that's, we're, we're all fighting for the same dollar. And so that's part of what they're going through when they're doing their due diligence with us. Yeah, everyone has their reasons for doing it. One of the reasons that I, I'm sure you hear often for not doing it is, well, it's a big capital investment and we don't have the money right now. So how are people addressing that, that problem? I'll bring this out. I'm smiling pretty large here if your listeners can see this. We determined, we had a lot of potential clients even that say, we love the product, but we don't have CapEx for it. So we decided to, uh, about a year ago, start creating a very strong banking relationship. And I'm happy to announce that in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be launching a loan program that's unsecured. So it's it's kind of one of the new things I'm bringing out, I guess, is uh, on this podcast. It's unsecured. Uh, there is a little bit of a due diligence process we do, but it's financing it for four to five years at a three and a half to three point eight percent interest rate today. We're not looking to make money off the loan. We're like a General Motors or a car manufacturer. We want to sell units. Our money is in the unit cell or the uh, the SKU cell, and so we're going to be launching that. And that's not really for the large clients. It's going to be for those syndicators who go, you know what? I love the product. I just don't have the CapEx for it. Or I'm halfway through, you know, I'm two years in and, and I just can't do it. And so being an unsecured loan was a real big factor here because most primary lien positions are going to say, sorry, you can't have indebtedness. You can't have a loan that's got a lien on it. So we worked very closely with a bank that we've done business with for years and they, knowing us and, and trusting in us, created some underwriting guidelines and it's unsecured. So there would never be a lien position on, on the uh, complex. So Jim, everything you're saying uh, it really sounds great. And I can see how larger syndicators or larger property owners would be very interested in it. But I have to think of my audience here which mm -hmm. is a lot of smaller independent uh, property owners. Maybe they have some single families, a, a duplex. They're very handy. They like to do it themselves. They, they, they would probably say, well, this sounds great. I'm just going to go do it myself. Um, give them some advice on how they can do it themselves. So a couple different things. One of the very first things I think that they can do that I've, I've seen others do is simply going in and painting the closet a white or a, a light gray or something of that nature and changing the lighting can very much help the situation. Um, so that's, that's one of the very first things I would say that is very low cost that they can do within a day to two days. Um, I think one of the other things to consider, is, and that's before you even get into the actual storage aspect of things. I think one of the other things that they should look at is there are a number of creative ways I've seen people go in, uh, we've done this for clients where they have wire racking. They don't want to remove it all. They just want to put like a shoe tower in, or they want to do some base level changes to give a little bit more utilization of storage. One of the best places to go find out about organized aspects of this 
is an IKEA uh, or even a uh, mainly because of cost. Uh, Home Depot has a line out there, as well as Lowe's has a line out there, and you can really piecemeal something together that improves the space from a storage side. Uh, another one, a little bit more on a higher end level, would be um, 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 Container Store. So that's a little bit higher end product line. Uh, but you, again, I think cost effectively, if, if you're handy like myself, then you can get pretty creative and ripping out some of the stuff, patching and very quickly painting in certain things and adding a couple elements that give the, the look and feel of something different, uh, but utilizing the space better. As we wrap it up, give our listeners one last pitch on the value proposition of paying attention to your closets and optimizing your storage space. If you're an individual that is going out there and you're, you're renting, which I'm assuming all the audience is here, then one of the things you need to consider is that the environment out there has been very conditioned to not change in certain areas. It's all about investing into the, the uh, kitchens, the baths, and so forth. But you may have already done all of that. And so now you're trying to figure out how to move the needle, which is what I had to try to do as well, move the needle on rent increases or just differentiation. So one of the things you really need to consider is what are some of those elements that you can go invest into? And in the area of closets, it's going to be, can I differentiate and create something that's a nice space like all the other spaces in the property set? And will that support a rent increase? And only time can tell on that within yours. I would definitely tell any listener that they should test before scaling. We did the same thing. You test it, you see if you can get it. If you can, do a little bit more and then scale out from there if you've got a lot of units or something of that nature. And, and you'll learn from this, you'll tweak this. We have clients that'll come in and they'll load the closet up with tons of SKUs, you know, load it all the way up. And then they'll come back a little bit later and say, hey, we need to dial back. We're not getting the rent supports. We're getting high rent supports, but not the ones we wanted. Uh, so let's go in with a little less product. That way we can get our cost in line. So I would say, look out there. Uh, another thing, take examples from the larger groups. If you've got an apartment complex, go look at some of the bigger guys out there, walk them, look at them, see what they're doing from amenities uh, in general and how they engage the audience and what they tell the new residents or potential new residents. That's one of the big lessons that I've learned is that um, a lot of these large companies shop one another. They walk the units and you should be doing the same thing so you can at least get an understanding and maybe budget in for the future. So it's not so much about pitching closets as it is mindset, I think, a lot of times, uh, Brian. How would people find out more about closets or get a hold of you or someone about the product? So they can reach us at uh, our website, closets at C-L-O-Z-Z-I-T-S dot com. Or you can always reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm a big believer in LinkedIn. So you can uh, definitely connect with me out there um, or J Monk. And that's J M O N K at closets, C L O Z Z I T S dot com. Well, Jim, I want to thank you for coming on the show to talk about closets, which is kind of an unsexy topic, but the way that you <laughs> presented it is just, you know, how we should think about it as rental property owners and how it can increase our, our net operating income. You know, the ways that you're going about it, and I appreciate you sharing some tips for our do-it-yourselfer uh, listeners Absolutely. as well. Um, and then the ways that people are using it for strategic tax purposes and also um, the financing that you talked about. Very helpful conversation. Thank you so much for having it with us today. Been a pleasure. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. And you can find out more about me by going to higinvestor.com. That's H-I-G investor.com. And you can also ask questions and join us on Facebook by going to RPOA, Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast. This episode was sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single-family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB & Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. 
You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review. 